Now tonight, um, peacemakers, so blessed are the peacemakers. I hope we value uh, peacemakers because we really need them. Now there is a difference between peacemaking, appeasement, and peacekeeping. Um, one of the most famous uh, appeasers was Neville Chamberlain um, at the time of the Second World War when he uh, looked to have a, 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 an agreement of appeasement, if you like, with Hitler. It didn't uh, work, obviously. Um, and he would go down in history, unfortunately, in many ways, as the person who took the wrong approach to evil, you could say. Yeah. So appeasement, this idea of just um, letting things ride in many ways is not where we want to go. Um, and there's a difference between peace keeping and uh, peace making. So what would you say is the difference? Let's have a thought here. So what's the difference between peace keeping and peace making? Uh, yes. I would have thought that making is an action, whereas keeping is sort of more passive. More passive, yes, that would be true. More passive, anything else? I'm not sure there's a difference between peace making and peace keeping, but it's, um, it's sort of, it's, it's conflict avoiding, isn't it? Mm -hmm. to, to Avoiding peace the conflict often yeah. requires facing things head on. Okay. Avoiding the conflict, yeah. I think if you're peacemaking, you've got to find where both sides are. <laughs> so to say, they're, they're, they're both, both sides. Places, and then you've got to find a way mm. to bring them onto a common way of okay. um, And so there's, there's a lot more to it, I think, because you've got to mm. understand. Yeah both sides and they're not on the same way for to start with. Whereas if you're peacekeeping, you're just basically put, almost like policing mm. any deviations from that right. okay. Very good point. That's really well. I think yeah. peacekeepers deserve our respect. Yeah. All right, when the United Nations are operating as peacekeepers, they're often operating in dangerous situations to themselves. And I think they do deserve respect. Um, I was very touched by, recently the England football team played in Kosovo. I don't know if you watched it, but um, it really moved me that the arrival of the English team in Kosovo was greeted by the locals as they were heroes coming home. And there were banners everywhere um, welcoming uh, the English team, which you don't generally see when you go and play abroad. Um, and the, the national team, the Kosovo national team, gave up their nice hotel for the England team to stay in. And they went up to some mountain place to stay. Because, because the British troops were a key part of Kosovo becoming a nation during the conflict in the 90s. Um, their stadium holds 13,500 um, uh, uh, spectators. They had 300,000 applicants. And it wasn't just to watch a football match, it was to see the England team play. I, it, I, was, really, I was really touched uh, to see that. So peace, peacekeeping is of value, but the difference is that peacekeeping is keeping people apart. Yeah. Peacemaking is bringing people together. Mm -hmm. So peacekeeping is a good thing, but it's incomplete. We could say from God's perspective, because God doesn't want to just keep people apart who are likely to hurt one another. He wants to bring healing, reconciliation, mm -hmm. and a real relationship between himself and his people who have rebel, we could say, and hurt him, but also people on this earth between one another. Peacemaking peace makes it possible for people to come together who would otherwise be in ongoing conflict, whether only emotional, okay. verbal, or, or physical. And I, I think it's one, of those, it's one of the most difficult, but also one of the most rewarding things about being a Christian. Mm -hmm is to have that opportunity, that privilege, of being a peacemaker. And we're going to talk a bit about this today, hopefully, in a way that will help us to, I hope, have a greater zeal to be peacemakers uh, for the people around us. So first of all, let's talk about God and being a peacemaker. I um, rather like these examples in Zechariah of God talking about what he's up to with his people. He says, uh, and this is of his people that have gone into exile because of their rebellion. He says, I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people. I will be faithful and righteous to them as their God. And in chapter 10 of Zechariah, I will bring them 
back from Egypt, which is not necessarily literal Egypt, it's the code word for being in exile. I'll bring them back from Egypt, gather them from Assyria, I'll bring them to Gilead and Lebanon, and there will not be room enough for them. So God has a vision for a reconciliation with his people. And he sent his prophets. Let's name a few prophets that came as peacemakers. Who can you think of who came as peacemakers that God sent? Jeremiah. Prophets. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, he came. Any others? <coughs> Jonah. Jonah to, to Nineveh. A good example. He, he didn't want to do it, but uh, he struggled with that mission as a peacemaker. But that's a good example, yes. Jonah, Jeremiah. Micah, Ezekiel, okay, yeah. yeah. God's people struggling in their relationship with him. So one of the, I put this on the handout. Yes, one of the phrases that I was used when I was studying some theology at, at the college was that uh, God's prophets are the covenant enforcers. And I rather like that phrase because God and his, co God and his people had an agreement. Right? They had a covenant, a special relationship, and which is really all about God reaching out to his people. But he says, as long as you do this, we're going to be close, we're going to be tight, it's going to be awesome. And then, of course, God's people would stray from that, start worshipping other um, gods and idols. And then God would send the, the prophets, not to essentially condemn Israel, but to say, hey, you know this covenant you agreed to? You remember Sinai? You remember all that? God loves you so much, he's missing you. Come back. So they're, coming, they're, they're approaching God's people to say, come back to the relationship. And the prophets in many ways operated as peacemakers. That's what they were in many ways. We tend to think of the prophets as either very strange individuals <laughs> um, or, or perhaps fire and brimstone, like, you know, God's going to judge you. But it, it wasn't, that wasn't the point. Uh, it's true God was, at, was, it, was going to operate in judgment on Israel on terms that Israel had agreed to. But his desire was that the prophets would open the hearts of God's people so that there would be a peace made Amen. again. So he sent his, his prophets again and again and again. You might want to do, as I suggest on here, do a search in your Old Testament for phrases like, bring them back. Mm. Phrases like that. And have a look at God's desire. You'll find passage after passage, verse after verse, of God expressing his desire to have peace with his people. It's quite moving, because it's very personal. It's not God operating as a distant deity. It's God saying, I love you, I want to be with you. So that's uh, one aspect we should talk about. I think the, the other aspect, uh, which is very familiar to us, is the way that Jesus operated as a peacemaker. God, so that we went from God's enemies to being uh, God's friends. Ephesians 2, he himself is our peace. This is why it's important to think about Jesus when we're trying to help make peace. Whether it's between someone who's not a Christian to become a Christian, to be at peace with God, or between two Christians. Being a peacemaker is embedded into the DNA of, of a church. It, it should be. It's part of what we are. In other words... To make it, uh, um, to state something that I think is obvious, is evangelism isn't something so much we do, we have to do, it's a task. Mm. It's part of who we are. Um, making peace with one another in this, uh, in this congregation is not just something that is a task to be done, it's part of who we are. We, we, we just are peacemakers. And even between congregations, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment, it's, it's, just, it's just part of us because Jesus is our peace. He's our peace made the two groups one, destroyed the barrier. I mean, whenever there's not peace, there's a barrier. We're not the people who build walls. We're people who bring them down. The dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. Through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. I mean, you can get Paul's in a bit of a... Paul, Paul's, as he writes this, I think he's in one of those... Um, uh, it's all flowing out of him moments. He's just writing and writing. He's got a scribe, right? He's, I can just see the scribe struggling to keep up as Paul. is like, he's at peace, and he's this, and he's that. 
Um, but it is so much part of the heart here. In Colossians 1 verse 20, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So a costly, a costly peace. Peacemaking is costly. And again, we'll talk a bit more about it in a minute. But if it, if it took a cross to create peace between us and God, it's going to cost something as we try to make peace with one another. It's just part of the, part of the landscape. Now, I've given you on the handout something we won't look at now, but I think is inspiring and well worth a Bible study, is the way that Jesus deals with Peter's restoration. The way that Jesus makes peace between himself and Peter. Peter who uh, promised that he would not let Jesus down. Peter who Jesus said, mm, you're going to deny me. And then the example of him calling down, not just saying I don't know the man, which he does say, but, but calling down curses from heaven on his head to say I don't know the man. I mean, that's, that's not just like, Jesus, who's that guy? No, this is, you're cursing yourself. I mean, it's really intense. And so if you think about how Jesus felt about that, because he does say in one of the Gospels that Jesus turned and looked at it. So Jesus was aware of what was going on in the moment. Not just he knew it was going to happen, but whilst it was happening, he was aware of it. Somewhere off in, not in the far distance, but you know, not right next to him. And then what he does in John 21, mm. and the way that he reconciles with Peter, is a beautiful, powerful thing. So that's a good personal Bible study. And good fruitful material if you're trying to help someone be reconciled. Either with yourself or to help people. I would say this example is a, is a really good one to, uh, to reflect on. Um, and let's also talk about Paul for a moment here. Now I'm going to, this is a slide that comes from the series on 2 Corinthians we did. Was it three years ago or something? I forget exactly. But I pulled this out in my presentation on 2 Corinthians to re refresh our memory tonight. Just about how... Paul was so desperately keen for the church in Corinth to do well and to have a good relationship with that church. Now, without going into all the details on this, but let me just say this. So what we've got is on the far left, Acts 18, Paul starts the church. He founds the church in Acts 18. And then he writes a letter which is now lost to us. When things, there must be some things going on in the church there. So he writes a letter which is referred to in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, that letter I wrote you before. We don't have that letter, but he wrote a letter. And then um, someone from Chloe's household goes to find Paul. That's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1 and chapter 7. To say, everything back in Corinth isn't good. There's some stuff that you need, you know, you need to know about. Bad stuff going on. So what does Paul do? He writes 1 Corinthians, which we have. Sends it with Timothy. And that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 4 and 1 Corinthians uh, 16. So he sends Timothy, and the cross at the bottom of the thing there is to indicate it didn't go well. <laughs> it went back, it was, the letter wasn't received well, Timothy was not received well, Paul's just trying to help, but it doesn't go well. And we know that because Paul mentions that in 2 Corinthians. Then we know also Paul went and visited, that's mentioned in 2 Corinthians 2 and chapter 12. And so he thought, it didn't work with Timothy, and uh, it didn't work with my first letter, so I'm going to go myself. We also know that didn't go well. <laughs> He mentions that in 2 Corinthians. Then he writes another letter, which is lost, which he sends with Titus. And Titus goes, according to 2 Corinthians 2 and chapter 7, and he comes back again to Paul and says, things are going well now. Things are going in the right direction. There's been a good response to the letter you sent me and to Titus. Uh, to Titus going. And then he writes 2 Corinthians, which he sends, and that's received well. And then he goes again himself, it mentioned in Romans 15, as he goes to collect the money for the poor Christians in Judea on his way to Judea to, to take that money there. Can you see the commitment Paul has to this church? Wow. Even though they reject it, even though they reject Timothy, who he talks about as his son, and one is really deeply in his heart, he writes all these letters. And it wasn't easy to do. You couldn't fire off a quick email, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this was hard to do. And he had a lot of other stuff going on in his life. And he was working hard. And he founded the church. And they rejected him and didn't appreciate him trying to help. I, I think 2 Corinthians is one of my favorite New Testament books these days. Because mm -hmm. it's a little complicated in places. But largely because you get, you get a, a view of Paul's heart for the Corinthian church over 
an extended period of time. We're talking there about, say, seven years. Mm. Seven mm. years of Paul's relationship with the church in Corinth. Desperate to try and help them be okay with God and okay with him. Um, what a commitment. Mm. Sometimes it is long term. Then some things don't get resolved quickly. So I love that example in, uh, in Paul. And also, it's worth reflecting, and we haven't got time now, but reflecting on the little book of Philemon, or Philemon. What a wonderful book about reconciliation. You probably know the story. Onesimus is a slave of Philemon, who's a Christian. He runs away. He somehow bumps into Paul, or someone takes him to see Paul when Paul's in Rome. I think I'm right in saying, I'll go right here. And he becomes a Christian under Paul's influence. And Paul loves Onesimus. And he's very helpful to him, and he's, a, he's really encouraging, and Onesimus obviously loves Paul. But Paul says, you know what? Onesimus is unfinished business. You need to go back to Philemon. But bear in mind that Philemon had the right to beat Onesimus under law for abandoning him as a, as a runaway slave. It wasn't unknown even for slaves to be killed by their masters when they were captured, when they'd run away. It didn't happen often, but it wasn't unknown, but he certainly could have been beaten and... Um, and, and he just, so he doesn't know what it's going to be like when he goes back. And Paul says, you need to go back because you need to be reconciled. You're a brother. Philemon's a brother. We've got to make sure you're okay. It's not okay to say, I'm in Rome. I'm in uh, wherever I'm in, in Asia Minor. Um, Eastern, and, and I'm sure everybody's fine now because we're all Christians. So it's all fine. Mm, he says, great no, you, great need, you need to go back and, and make mm -hmm. sure. So he sends the letter, which is an amazing letter. And he goes and he sends him and it gets, we think it gets resolved well. Um, and Paul again, his heart, he loses Onesimus. Paul is in jail. In jail in the first century, you didn't get three meals a day. No. You got fed if your friends came and fed you. Onesimus might have been one of those people. There we go. There we go. Onesimus might have been one of those people bringing Paul food. He sends him back to Philemon. He doesn't really need him because he's concerned about that, that relationship being put right. And Paul even says, look, if he owes you anything, I'll pay it back. Okay, this, this is a high commitment to peacemaking. It's a great inspiration to us all. An upward call and a serious challenge, I would say. Let's talk about peacemaking in real life. How long have we got left? About five minutes. Let me share personally a little bit here. So we talked about principles and Bible examples. I think peacemaking is one of the most demanding parts of the Christian life. And we often talk about our struggles with our consistency of our prayer life or our Bible study and our confessing our sins and that kind of thing. And that's we should do that. But I suspect we don't talk enough about our struggles with peacemaking. Mm. With people that we're trying to help become Christians or be restored to the faith or even with one another, or even between us and people that are now in other churches, perhaps, other congregations. Since it's such a part of God, such a part of Jesus, so much in the scriptures, it's so much about what Christianity is really all about, I wonder if we should talk more about and invest more effort in peacemaking. Mm -hmm. Amen. God taught me a big lesson about this after 2003. So many of us will be aware, but in case you're not, after 2003, uh, globally, our congregations went through a time of upheaval of a very serious nature. And it affected us in the UK as much as anywhere else, less so in terms of Valley, um, for your, uh, and, and for, I think, your credit, our credit, I wasn't here then, I'll say your credit, um, I think that's to the church's credit here. But I would also say, Perhaps, though, you, you, we didn't get exposed to some of the depths of what peacemaking means because we didn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I was, I was there in London, when we had um, one congregation at the end of 2002 and the beginning of 2003, we had 10 congregations who were separate and not talking to one another. We, we had a situation where we were either going to remain separate or we were going to find a way to talk and reconcile and find peace. And for whatever reason, and I, I don't know what play, I don't want to play this up too much, but for whatever reason, God put me in a role of leading the peacemaking process. Let's put it that way. And 
And I'll tell you all the, the whole story another time when we have more time. But it took seven years. That's funny, I was looking at the Corinthians, <laughs> the seven years. Oh, right. um, it took seven years. It took seven years of meeting with people week after week to talk. It took seven years of perseverance. It took seven years of prayer. It took seven years of talking. It took seven years of being misunderstood in terms of motives and aims. Um, and it was very costly. Um, uh, it took seven years, and then in 2010, essentially the London church became one church, essentially. The North joined a bit later, but uh, it came to fruition. The point wasn't the ten churches becoming one. That was a fruit of what was really important, which is that we talk. And when you've been hurt, as we all were in 2003, and we've divided into our silos, there's no motivation to talk. No. In fact, there's motivation to not talk because mm -hmm. you've had enough pain for a while. Mm -hmm. And we, we understand that. And, and there is timing and there is uh, patience uh, that are, are important. And so I just wanted to share the fruits of trying to summarize seven years of listening and talking. I just want to try and summarize that for us. I think it might be uh, helpful. And I'd say it's, it's this that Peacemaking in real life is about seeking to understand more than about seeking a specific outcome. Mm. Wow. So I had a vision that the ten churches would become one, but the more important thing was that we sit and talk and listen. And sometimes that's hard because sometimes the people you're listening to are wanting you to bring about a particular outcome. They want a particular outcome, you may not, but they may, but you've still got to listen. Seeking to understand more than to seek a specific outcome. Secondly, to accept being understood about your motives and your meanings. When you're trying to help two people be reconciled, you may well be misunderstood mm. about why you're doing it, or about what you're trying to achieve, or the methods that you're trying to, to do it with. And so when I was trying to do that in, in the London congregation, some people thought it was, I don't know, some kind of power thing. Some people thought it was about, um, I don't know, there were so many different things. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Misunderstandings. You've got to accept it. You have to accept it. Jesus had to deal with this. Mm. I don't think it's by, um, it's not an accident that the next beatitude is about being persecuted. Mm. Which we'll talk about Sunday's sermon is going to be on that. We get misunderstood. Thirdly, if you're going to be a good peacemaker, you've got to be flexible about your mm. methods and your paths to ultimate reconciliation. You can't say, by this time next week, you know, everything's going to be fine. You, you've got to feel your way through it. Some reconciliation uh, happens quickly. Some takes a long time. We need to be patient, as God is patient with us. Let's face it. And th fourthly, you've got to keep God at the center. When I had meetings with people, when we had discussions um, uh, about the future of the London church, there were two things we always did. We always prayed, and I always opened the Bible. You may say, well, that's kind of obvious. But it's not when you're, in, when you're in the middle of a heightened emotive state. Sometimes God does go out of the picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I think that's very important that we have our Bibles open and that we pray. Mm -hmm. Keeping God at the center. It's not about me, mm -hmm. really. It's not about you. It's not about these people. Mm -hmm. It really is about God. We've got to listen. Uh, I think we've got to talk or we die. We either get closer or we get further apart. Mm -hmm. We surface the needs as we listen, and then we find out how much we need each other. That's how we find out. And when we find out how much we need each other, that can drive us to realize we, need, we desire reconciliation more. Because once, once I realize how much I need you, then I'm more motivated to find a way for us to be closer. And then be, that brings glory to God. There's a lot more we could say about that, but don't have the time, obviously, this evening. And I would say those are more important uh, principles. Just to wrap up, how do we develop a more peacemaking spirit, or a spirit that uh, grows in, in peacemaking, not only skills, but also in the spirit, the heart, of what it means to be a peacemaker? There are several things, I think, to, to think about, but two in particular I would suggest. One is to reflect on Matthew chapter 18, 21 to 35, and the, uh, the parable there about God's mercy to us. And that may help us mm -hmm. 
to help uh, us to have mercy on others. And the second is to realize that the Beatitudes can help us here. Being poor in spirit creates a humility that helps us to see the world the way God sees the world, to mourn over the state of the world, and to be a meek person, strong but gentle and humble, to seek righteousness above all else, which I would define particularly in terms of being doing right by God and doing right by one another. It's, it's not just about some kind of moral thing, righteousness, or that there's an element, but it's also about relationship. And righteousness in the Old Testament is more about relationship than it is about specific morals and ethics. So if we desire to be right with God and right with one another, then we'll end up being peacemakers. Um, being a merciful person means that we'll have the mercy to listen to people even if they're not being very merciful to us. Being pure of heart means we desire what is right even if it's uncomfortable, costly and painful for us to, in, to experience it. And then we end up being peacemakers, being like Christ. So, growing in the Beatitudes will help us to be uh, effective peacemakers. It's up to us to think about the ways in which we can be useful to God as pe peacemakers today. Maybe it's a, a good thing over the weekend to think and pray about who's God brought into your life where you could operate as a peacemaker. Someone who's not yet a Christian or someone who could be restored to the faith. That you could be a peacemaker for that person. Mm -hmm. You could listen. You could help. You could be the person to get alongside them. Or perhaps it's someone in your family. Or perhaps it's someone in your family group. Uh, hopefully our family group Friday next week will be really great because we're all at peace. Uh, maybe you need to make some more peace in your family group. Maybe it's in this congregation. Maybe it's between congregations. You know, and I, I'm delighted that it's funny that I end up here because you know, I have a foot in more than, I'm in two places, right? I'm in Watford and I'm here. Watford's part of the ICCM family, if you like, of churches, and, and, and Thames Valley is not, and I don't see that as a bad thing, but I'm just saying it's interesting to be in both, and I see part of my life is, is to affirm the value of both and to be, to be some kind of connection. And I think it's really important that we don't uh, characterize other groups or other churches in a negative mm. way. Mm -hmm. And we don't say, well, that London church thing he did or does when we don't agree with something. We don't have to agree with everything, but we can't well, label. Labeling pushes people apart. That's right. Or even for some of us now and again, the, oh, I think the way that the ICOC do things, da, 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 da. It, it's a really unhelpful statement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because ICOC is people. And I think it's, it's about people in the end. Mm -hmm. right? we, we need to be a little careful because mm -hmm. the way we treat others is the way that often then we're going to be treated. Yeah. And Jesus says in Matthew 7, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So as much as we would not like to be labeled, let's be sure not to label others. That's not the spirit of a peacemaker. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amen? So I hope that's helpful. There's a lot in there, and I know it's challenging, but the rewards are amazing. I mean, can you imagine what it's like to be around a real peacemaker? Someone who really cares about you having a great relationship with God and with other people and with you. I mean, being around great, really good peacemakers is a joy, and it changes the world. It changes your workplace, it changes your family, it changes your family group, it changes the spirit of a location. When we've got that spirit of, I will do whatever I can to make sure that we have peace in this place. I'm not looking at somebody else to do it. I'm going to be a peacemaker. It changes the dynamic. It changes the atmosphere. And when non-Christians come and see a group that's truly at peace with one another, deeply at peace, it stands out. It's attractive. It tells them Jesus is with us. Well, thank you very much. Have a great time with us.